Machine gun rap for all my niggas in the back. Stay in the back. I really did. Yes, I did change. Uh, he got his high school diploma, was accepted to two colleges, the low and the light in his eye. Lisa was encouraged. I wanted to speak publicly to little children with him. Look at him, look at me. We can overcome. See how he's changed his life? See how I changed my life? So on May 25th of this yes. year, she went before the parole board again. I respectfully request that you release him on parole today. Less than a month after his release, Frank Lewis went AWOL from parole. A warrant has been issued for his arrest. Lisa LaPierre's hope was betrayed. Lisa was the fifth robbery that night. All the other ones went simple. A little $50 here, give me your wallet, give me your bag, those type of opportunities. This night of July 11th, 1994, which could be a, a research, was the grand opening of the House of Blues Sunset Strip. So we was driving by and seeing all them people, the ladies like, oh. And this was, we were actually on our way home or back to the party because we had left from a party. We met up at a party and decided to do this. So he was finna take me back to the party and go home. And we seen these two women and one was walking right in front of us on her phone. I said, I want that phone. They tried to make it seem like he sent me to her. Truth of the matter is my greed, my self-esteem, my financial or lack of financial stability was the motivating factors. Nothing that he had to do or say created that motive in my mind. It was self-intended. Not to mention, back then, it's not like how it is today. Every motherfucker has a phone now. Back then, though, that must have been Snoop a rare Dogg occurrence. And Dr. Dre was the only people that you had expected to <laughs> see this. Yeah. And what had happened was her mother was a worry bug. And that's why she had provided her with, because her father was a baker in South Central. They lived in Torrance. Like this, we're going back to the 80s when it was real bad. So right before he had passed, the phone, it came out and he had bought that phone for his wife to be able to communicate from the landline at home to him at his business. So that phone became hers. Like she moms had had it sat down. So it wasn't even one of the newer models. Like it would have been like trying to go get a flip phone today <laughs> when there's iPhones. You feel me? I didn't even have the, I didn't know I was on a bunk mission. I was going to go get an out of dated phone. And that was the motivation as I got out the car. I smoked a little PCP that day. Not much, just a little. Some Cisco, if anybody's familiar with the, the beverage that they called it, did alcoholic beverage. That was like worse than Hennessy. <laughs> Drunk half a bottle of that. So I was physically not all the way there. Mentally, not all the way there being that seen the 92 riots, grew up in the crack pandemic. All of these factors of a broken home contributed to my mentality at this current moment. There's fear whenever you have a firearm and you're going to approach a potential target with the variables that could occur. They could try to grab the gun, the gun could try to go off, you could drop the gun. There are so many things going through this little kid's drunken mind that I just, at the last moment, wanted it to be over because I was start, starting to realize, like, why am I doing this? Got a little money in my pocket already. I'm already, we not supposed to do this. Follow my mind. First mind, my mom always told me, came in mind. Our first mind was to go back to the party. So I put the gun in the car. It was like, not halfway, but I would say 75% rolled up when I stuck the gun in. And this is the 90s before the, the we ever thought that we could push a button or roll up a window. It was like an exercise process. And she went through it quickly. <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> While honking the horn at the same exact time. This isn't what parole board wants to hear. 
This isn't what a Republican liberal society that his job is to make these laws to prevent this from happening here. But this is what truly happened. This wasn't a mentality of a, I'm just this cold-blooded killer that don't care about nobody. My attention was to try to get the phone, not the car, not harm nobody. But when the window started to go up and I went to take it out, it just went off and went straight through her neck and hit her roommate in the leg. Damn. I remember it. It said, I got to have a drink. I yep. remember it. I remember the blood, the scream, somebody, I don't know which one it was. I never even asked from when I got caught in the parole hearings and all that. I never asked who said, I'm shot. But I heard that, I'm shot, which made me think only one person was shot. Then I thought that I killed somebody, but all of the blood, it was like an explosion of blood. I ran the wrong way. The getaway car was this way, I went that way. It, it didn't take me long to realize because I seen, I was looking for the alley to dip in. I'm like, hold on. So I start running back the other way. So I ran starting from the driver's side where I shot from. Now I'm on the sidewalk coming because they were parked. So I ran up on the driver's side. Now I'm running back towards the passenger side. She tried to get out. And I swear this became a life-changing moment when or event when I started to mature and learn and get counseling that the fear that I put in her when she saw me, because Lisa was slumped and she was beginning to open the door to scream. She's screaming for help and thinking I ran the opposite way, not expecting. She told me this at parole board, Samantha Holcomb, I'm sorry, my apologies, because she's still a survivor. I don't know where she is, but at parole board, she told me she thought I was coming back to finish her. Think of that fear. The, I seen a change of complexion and we're talking 2.34 in the morning was the first call they got a shots. He's coming to kill me. Oh lady, I just ran her wrong. You see how things happen. Like this incident that just happened. It was uh, somebody posted something on Instagram and it got somebody killed. Presumptions, assumptions, witness testimony. It gets mercury. It gets so damn gray there. That's why I'm going to be an attorney so that I can help clear up some of these gray areas in the law. I get back to the car. And that's when, like I explained earlier, going past Roscoe's, the famous strip where Nipsey Hussle just got his star, the Walk of Fame. It, we're passing celebrities. Ain't no telling who we drove by on our way to commit this crime. And that's why I did 10 years in nine months. So now we're back to that boardroom. They decided they was gonna um, let me know they got tired, it's time to go. They say, uh, yeah, we're gonna hold you here until your court date. Somebody will be coming to talk to you about formal charges, go to the shoot. No, no, they said, they didn't say nothing but that. And they sent me back to fire camp. I got there while they was programming. They was making food, it was a Friday actually. So I was supposed to come home on a Friday. And I ate with the homies. We busting that one last spread and two uh, the institutional security came, picked me up, put me in handcuffs, took me to the hole. That was June. I stayed there until August in the hole. Keep it by, oh. I was supposed to be before court within 72 hours per my due process, 14th, 15th Amendment rights. Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual. I'm sitting in a little bitty cell by myself, isolated, no unsupervised phone calls, no visitation, nothing. Until we figure out what to do with this guy that just got paroled by the state of California parole board. That must be one of the most stressful times of my 42 years. How Not long did prayer. it feel like for you being in that little room? There's a Two month, years. yeah. 
two years. It felt like two years. Because think about it. I was in there three months. No, two months. And I've got to, what all I've got to think about, I should be at home right now. I should already be starting a job, doing school. I'm so far. I should have a wife by now and a child on the way. This is what I, that's, it felt like years. Man, it's so like somebody they, they... finally come see me though. The superintendent of the institution, that lady that faced all them charges and all that. And she, cause I've been filing grievance complaints. Like I feel this is cruel and unusual. My mom been calling and calling. So she came to say, we're going to send you to the lockdown gang unit. And till we figure out what the district attorney, Danette Myers is going to do with your case. All right. So they sent me to one of the worst units in the facility, high level gang activity. And there's 30 Crips and three bloods. Oh shit. <laughs> Bullet log, J.O. Felony. He said, I come from Morrow Cottage, the most hardest unit in Paso. I already went to Napomo, which a lot of people like Dubs, they was over there. They would debate that that was the hardest unit, but I came from there after supposed to go to fire camp. So now I get to see another side of negativity. Once I got off of lockdown, I got to get a phone call without they would put my calls on the speaker and I could only call my mom. And they would listen to everything. A staff member would be right there. So I got another phone call, even though I didn't trust that line either. But I got to hear a little bit of what was going on. And what led to my name coming up in September, Hood Day, 97, they were shooting the gun that I had shot Lisa with. Police was called. They came. 15 homies got caught in the gun that I did that shooting with. As well as, the remember, there's an unsolved murder on there now. Thurman Brown, that's his name. The unsolved murder. You get Thurman Brown, LA Times, Thurman Brown, homicide report. Unsolved murder. But somebody got convicted for it. But based on my name coming up, this man is free or however he would want to be called, no disrespect to him because he is trans of that community. But he obtained his freedom when they discovered that I shot Lisa with the gun he was supposed to have murdered Thurman Brown with. And that they convicted so him. He was in prison doing life. In prison. Wow. That's so deep. And when I go to court, I quickly realize that, that I'm not no longer gonna fly under the radar when the news was there. They had media coverage. Like I didn't know that my life of just flying under the radar and not being known was gonna change until I got to that court. Now keep in mind, I'm coming from California Youth Authority back to Juvenile Hall because I'm only 17. And this is after I went to that little lockdown unit with those 33 Crips. Some prolific individuals. There was, there was actually the starting of something there that a lot of people, this is something you could Google too. It's called the New Black Panther Movement. So their founder, Taco, uh, Sino Beam and Ken Dog, they were there. This is where that movement was started. And this woke me up into even more so. Now I'm coming back and they like, I had a stack of cards. I got a card from everybody because I like, nobody ever going to believe I'm talking to the FBI, the ATL, all these people. So everybody gave me their business card. So I'm showing them and they said, yeah, brother, the affliction of the man and all this, you feel me? So I'm really getting into that, into Islam, because my big homie, Lil Money, I was baby money from Crenshaw Mafia. Lil Money was at this facility, and he was the head uh, imam at the uh, chap for studying Islam and getting ready to battle whatever I faced at court. Because in my mind, I'm like, I almost went to a dope court for stabbing this guy. 
I'm gone for this. They're going to try me as an adult and put me away because I wasn't fully aware of the laws yet. That was the biggest concern that was on my mind. And remember, I told you moms was in the game doing her thing. She was going to get me a lawyer. She gave him $500 just to hear to see if he was going to take the case, like a little retainer just to hear. And he told her, regardless of what, I was going to be tried as a juvenile because I was too young. And I was going to be sent back to Y and it would be a waste of her to give me money. She said, yeah, you would have paid me if he was facing the life or something, but don't waste your money. He was real honest and upfront. I hit the juvenile hall facility. That was like a goal of mine when, or not a goal, but something I would like a wish. Like when I went to Y, like I wish I could go back to juvenile hall before I even knew I would be doing that. And the level of what we call juice, I think what would be the proper word for juice? Uh, privilege. It was on another level. Media up here for this dude. He's been locked up for four years. The longest person that was in there prior to that was nine months because you these kids getting tried as adults now. So they hit into everything is changing and i go to see a facility that i started from the ground up in silmar california i heard them in 95 94 talking about making a new facility that was going to house the kids tried as juveniles facing adult so they was going to send them there but I found out now when I got there, I see the building, the homie taking me on the tour because the guy who was in reception when I pulled up was an OG homie. And all of watchers that are going to watch that was in Silmar in the 90s. They remember the homie with the curl, OG dude from Athens Park, one of the founders, was a staff member there. So he remembered me off the top. Oh, you're back from Hawaii, young Frank. And he's explaining to me what's changed. And I see that the soccer field has become this new prison looking facility which is now like how Nellis, YTS, Paso, none of those institutions exist today. This institution is now our YA. I seen it come from the ground up. This juice card off the bat, there was a homegirl there. She my friend on Facebook. Shout out to Miss Lewis, straight Inglewood native. She made sure that I have Ritos, got to see the movies that I've been missing out on. So it was a hell of an experience. But going to court, they had me messed up. I was tried as an adult on the first day I go to court. My heart dropped. My mom said, oh, no. <laughs> this is a whole new era. I'm in a court I've never been in before. And I've been to JJC, the uh, uh, Inglewood Juvenile Court. I've been through all those little Los Padrinos court. This now was Silmar Court, the Valley Court, where we want to make an example out of young thugs to keep that out of here so we don't have to migrate to a whole nother place. We gave you all LA to destroy. Please stay away from the Valley. So I went to a dope court, and this is proof that the justice system works. First day I got there, they bounded me back. Like, no, you're not fit because at that age, remember, I did this crime in 94. The law changed to 14. They were looking at me as a 17-year-old. The crime was committed at 14. Like they, When they want to get you, they'll get you. Because if I didn't have a zealous uh, public defender, when I told him, like, man, they said I wasn't going to be trying no adult. Like, I was telling what the street homies was telling me. Like, oh, bro, you too young. So they were right. And I ended up back before the same idiot, though. Like, damn. But like I said, when I admitted this crime to my moms and told her I wanted to turn myself in, she told me to, if the time ever came, she said, if God wants you to be confined for that, he'll bring that. And I took that with ease. So when I wanted to tell, like, yeah, you're going to let me go home if I told you who killed Thurman Brown, which is a realistic thing about that. A man killed on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood and robbed a tourist from Texas coming to, I think he was coming to give his mother a liver or something. 
Like we messed up people's lives. And I shot a woman at 14. The most they could do for me is keep me there till I'm 25. So you don't think if I told them who killed Thurman, they was going to let me go? I knew this at 17. But also at 17, I knew like, no, I can't snitch. I have to stay strong. And out of all of it, I'm not going to lie. Like I said, I'm honest, transparent. It wasn't my being the hardest gangster at 17 years old that made me snitch on myself. It was me telling my moms and her telling me that when God wants you to take the responsibility, you'll know. I knew. So I told him it was me. I shot this woman. I don't know nothing about what happened July 4th, but when I, by the time I got the gun, I can't tell you anything from till when I shot her and went to jail a couple of days later for a different offense. I can't even tell you about the other murders on that gun. That was my story, and that's what I stuck to. I hear juvenile all now eating burritos, tacos, but there is a new generation. And keep in mind, I've been in jail four years now. I mean, kids just got arrested yesterday. Been never been to jail before. Like, so I'm hearing things that I've never thought. Like, there's this chirp thing. Was the chirp out yet? I don't even think the chirp was out in 97. There was new stuff though from 94 to 97 that had me like, woo. So what this did is it added to me wanting to come home. The whole time I'm still telling myself, if I want to just move to Alabama and get that witness protection, all I got to do is say this. But I felt that God wanted my story. And this is Miss Lewis, Sandy Lewis. Shout out to her being a Silmar Juvenile Hall staff. And she was only like 25, 26. I'm 17, finna turn 18. Her informing me of how to get a car. Like for me, all my life, I seen homies hand another homie some money and drive away in his low rider. I never knew you'd have to qualify, have credit. She opened up my mind to a different train of thought. I decided the quickest way for me to do this, instead of fighting with this judge who clearly is an idiot, he sent me to a dope court and I shouldn't have been. Let me just go ahead and take a, I plead guilty and go start whatever consequence I got to start. In the process of doing so, there was this other dude there, a dude named Marky Boy from Sanford. A crazy, he was like one of those people with like I seen in juvenile hall that I knew right then was prime for why he never made it though. They tried him as an adult and sent them away, but he was a very high profile case. I seen him when I got out on true stories of the highway patrol. Uh, that flipped me out like, damn, that's Marky boy. But he was doing the most. He had a female staff. I don't want to name her, but she was bringing contraband in. On my 18th birthday, I had him bring me in some contraband. I was getting in contraband as well, but my birthday is when it went down and we did too much. And there was fights for people being drunk, smelling marijuana. I had turned the juvenile hall in the YA and they felt that at 18, it was now time for me to face the county jail. Whole different monster. Being that I've never been. I went from 14 to YA, so damn. Before I go further, I got to keep my youngsters in tune with wisdom. All of this isn't to glorify. What I'm doing is I'm showing how I took negative tools and made a toolbox. But what it's the job of you young homies to do right now is listen to my story and reverse the roles from negativity to positivity. And as I go on showing my change, I'm going to show you how I took out that bad wrench and replaced it with a good wrench. So you look at life as a toolbox. Yeah, we know how to graffiti. We know how to know who enemies are. We know how to identify hoods, where to go, where not to go. Useless information. Unless you got a lot of chains on and don't want to be robbed and want to know what place to go to. Unless you want to worry about that for your whole life and not how to buy a house, 
buy a car, sign a lease, and grow, you just keep that same toolbox. After I went and played guilty, I seen my victim for the first time, personally. Like what they tried to do is keep it separated. So she would come while I wasn't there because they were scared of me. Like news all there, they was making me feel like a celebrity monster type of person. When I was just a, a, a intoxicated young 14 year old that had learned behaviors in a broken home environment that created a decision that I would regret for the rest of my life, but I shouldn't be judged for. Went back to the county after they busted us right before I know, as a matter of fact, I didn't even ask what prompted me to plead guilty. As a matter of fact, going to the county, I wanted to stay, as a matter of fact, as long as I could with Miss Lewis and the eating burritos, having the easier access to contraband. I hit that blood module and I got to go. You would think a, a, a unit made for one gang that was made and created in 1972 through 75 for a purpose of unity and fighting the aggressor would be a humble place to be. Worst jailhouse experience ever. And I went to court probably three days after my birthday's on the 11th. I went to court December the 18th, get me out of here. I shot her, I'm sorry, do what you gotta do. So I only lasted probably three weeks in the county jail. They immediately sent me back to my to the youth authority. I was state property. Now I'm back. My biggest concern now is how much time I'm going to do. I've already given them four. Shouldn't that time count? It's been mostly good. I haven't stabbed nobody. I haven't raped nobody. I haven't uh, uh, masturbated in front of the staff. These are things that were a common occurrence that I stayed away from. No. <laughs> Start over, buddy, with an attempted murder charge. So I'm starting with four years. And this was 98 already, because I they can't got me in 97, all that process. Now we ended 98. They say you're going home 2002, you do good. I was pissed off and upset, so wasn't no room to do good. And within Remember, I left, it was 33 Crips and three Bloods. When I came back, the eyes he became better. It was 15 Crips and 12 Bloods. That's the most Bloods that I'd ever seen. They was like younger homies. I was taking a step up. I was now becoming looked at as the older kid. He'd be, I'm going on five years now, you know? Got that seniority. And, yeah. And I started acting an asshole. Started a race riot and got sent up to YTS, Chino, California. Worst youth authority facility in the state of California where Ms. Baker was murdered. There was so much going through my mind. So now I get in the van to make my way transport to YTS. And before we do that, we stop at the California Department of Correction, Chino Institute, where we hear the gunshots all the time. They're right across the street. That's a four yard prison over there. They got a four or three yard over there. So there's gun towers. So we wake up to the shooting. We hear them practicing the gunfire. We stop there. First, I thought they was gonna drop me off at the Chino prison, but we picked up somebody. No, no, no. I'm leaving from Paso to uh, Chino. We was going to, we went to Corcoran where Charles Masson was at. That's where we stopped at because we was up north in Paso Robles. We stopped at, we stopped at two prisons actually. First, we stopped at CMC. That's the first time I seen a gun tower, seen a prison yard. Like, damn, that's prison. What are we doing here? An inmate gets in the van. And remember, it's a state facility. Now, they got rid of adult commitments. So you won't go catch a guy with life coming from prison going back to Y. But if you got to get out of Y with a juvenile commitment and still have YA time and go to prison, retardedly, you come back. And what that is, is 
I learned later was a uh, uh, they were do uh, double charging the state our taxpayers like ourselves because they was getting you to pay for this dude while he was in the adult facility. Even though when Miss Baker got killed with that Reform Act, they say no more adult commitments. He's still on adult parole, making him an adult commitment. But as long as California could find a way to tax it, they'll make it all right. After leaving that little new Black Panther group in Paso, becoming a leader and getting that acknowledgement and respect, I wanted to now get that knowledge and understanding of life. That was my mentality of how to stay alive going to this facility that is notorious. That's where the bloods, according to King Baba Louie, was started, even though I agree and disagree. That was a main, that was where the seed was planted, I should say. It was planted there and then it got out from some of those kids and found these kids that were just defending ourselves from the aggression of the Crips. So they went, the, the YA babies came and brought that YA mentality of blood to those guys like Lavenders and the big homies from Brim. And that's where this blood thing started from. So that was like the first history. So now I went in there, like I said, I wanted to learn in advance, but it ended up getting turned into learning more about gang because I didn't come through the regular blood route. Most of these homies have been born and raised in their hoods. I was just the one he saw us and then they ran into the celebrity guy now and he was pushing a line. So there was a lot of learning coming. It wasn't pressure because I never tried to lie about it. Like this is what happened. I could have been Tiny Whack from Coin Paru or Money from Chris Muff. And God, thankfully, I didn't get no dealings with dude like that. Knowledgement, understanding. And the first dude that was my roommate, in the orientation unit. This is how I learned about Miss Baker. He was the dude, he's rest in peace now, country from Inglewood family, that they tried to uh, get to make it happen. They wanted him to take care of this woman before she told on him. So he gave me the whole get down. But like I say, that's still telling because those staff can still be charged for that murder. So I, I keep it close to my pocket, but I, it lets you know the mentality when you know you're dealing with people who had somebody murdered, like he telling me like, yeah, that's one of them right there. That's one, him, him, him. Because all of these staff down there, there, even though I heard 50% of the staff and of that 50%, 95% uh, uh, of the female of that 50% that quit. So a lot of women left. There were very few females working in YTS when I was there. But Keep in mind, you had certain staff that we knew about. So that means they'll bring you whatever. The corruption level based on that fact alone made rehabilitation close to impossible. And going back to what I say about the dude who's the alleged suspect in the PNB situation, that's the fifth bad news covered incident. So there's cats that was up there that he got out and killed a lot of people. I use that as motivation. And this is what the kids should get from me if they get anything. Our young men, our little gangsters, young homies, and Crips, Bloods, Sewer, North, everybody. Y'all all need to consider this. It's either stressing on paying bills, where to buy a home that will benefit you more when you want to sell that home and buy a bigger home. The economy, who's going to be the next president, the electoral college vote, these things here, you can learn and then come to this YouTube and hear people like myself on the baddest station ever and get what a broken home does to create what you don't want to be. Don't follow in our footsteps. This is what took me to change. My mom got busted crossing the border. She didn't actually get busted. What happened was there was three cars. They used to always bring six decoy cars and a backup just in case you get caught, got to jump out. They had a system. And one of the dudes in the system got caught. And he told on all the cars, so they got everybody in jail. 
moms was facing some time. They was telling her either you tell on who told or who was providing the dope, the link, or you do all the time. So this is what I was facing in 2001, as well as seeing that uh, I didn't want to be a gang member on the streets because I had gang tattoos, cross hoods, crossed out. Like y'all thought, what's his name? Uh, fight, fight, crib. Oh, no. I had things crossed out. And I was just looking at myself. We couldn't barely see through the mirror in the institution. It was so scratched up. But I looked at the mirror emotionally and said, this ain't what I want to be. The woman, Lisa, that I shot, she went to the board. Like how my mama was going to get me to court, she was going to get her voice heard by the parole board. So now I have to look at the woman I shot. I have to hear what I did. So justification can no longer be on the table because you got reality. You can't justify with lies and fiction and drug use reality because reality is what it is. And I was twisted and she helped me. This is my victim, Lisa, rest in peace. She helped me understand first and foremost, she didn't hate me because she was white. Even though some of why I shot her was because she was white. Cause I don't, I wouldn't have went up to a colored or Latino person car like that. So I know I could say that with a hundred percent confidence. I was not racist, but I was prejudiced and biased and angry. Learning all of these things. And then the devil always has to come as you'll see through my whole story to try to distract me. Like, I can't let this dude get a thousand to two thousand to twenty thousand subscribers on his YouTube channel because then they'll see you don't have to get gang related tattoos on your face, disrespecting a whole organization just to get thousands of followers. You don't have to go shoot and rob somebody to take their chain just to be reputable and noticed. This is what I want to tell people like both Jason and Mark. If Lisa was still alive, my probation officer, society taxpaying, legitimate, hardworking individuals. I want to say that, and not only y'all, because it goes more so to the Jesse Jacksons, Obamas, Michelle, Magic, LeBron, the people who are should be our leaders, our examples, our motivators. I don't want much in life, but a safer environment for my children to grow up in, a more established political arena, and more police accountability. Like over, we're talking about 50 years from now. A lot of people say, what do you see yourself five years, 50 years from now? I want to see mass incarceration, those type of women's rights, those things right now should be our vocal point. Now, I can't, this part of the message is only for African-Americans. When we talk about why did PMB get done that way? Why was Tupac murdered? What happened to Biggie? When we talk about these situations, which were all gang related, we have to understand why that 17 year old on September 12, 2022, is still fresh and happening, did what he did. Because now see, say if Night Owl, suspect Freddie Lee, Don Trump, would have had the opportunity to come home with the knowledge of knowing that there was a check waiting for every level. Like if a program was set up with five levels of, a, of achievement, get a high school degree, six months of no incarceration, parenting classes with your child, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. We just spent 52 trillion in a 20 year war that we flew away from literally with the enemy falling from the plane begging for us not to go. And my whole life we've been dare, uh, say no, you can do it. 
I believe the children are the future. We've been taught and promised so much, but failed by not racism, but a political spectrum based on greed and corruption. There should be some kind of sympathy. Like I believe that people don't subscribe to my channel because he's that guy that shot those white women. He did this. He disre He voted for Trump. These type of things, people come up with these presumptions. But I believe if everybody donated me a dollar because they are proud, I've never been to prison. I would get on a lie detector today to test today and show I've never shot a gun since 14 years old. Not at a gun range, not in practice, none. If everybody gave me a dollar for being proud of me for doing that, and the next time a 17 year old in the car with his daddy looking at him pathetic and weak because we can't eat tonight, and somebody gave him a dollar if he decided to go file a job application, a step would go rob somebody. We could change the way that people react because we know money is the main source of the trigger. Let's just give it to these people for doing something that's positive. But at the same time, and this goes back into the story of me getting ready to go home and what my mentality was. You have to earn everything like this reparations and social security and section eight. That is how we were talking off the camera earlier about how they were dangling that freedom over my head. That's what the democratic party has done to the disillusional can't claim party because they don't vote, don't understand the none of that. They've been dangling food stamps and all that over your heads in order to keep you in line with something. Like I just, right now what I'm doing at, as work is I'm part of a political campaign to try to get certain Democrats elected here in Nevada. So I get a random list of names of registered voters to knock on their door. And this is an assembly election for the assembly members so I'm in influential areas where there's mansions. I'm walking around amazed. Barely anybody comes to the doors, but I happen to get one of those Republicans that tried to belittle me quickly. And I, in my mind, I'm like, oh, you one of those mega supporters. See, I voted for Trump two times, but I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm a supporter of a presidential candidate that's not a politician. There's a huge difference there. Yeah. So yeah. when I get down to it and I tell this person, hold on, hold on. Who do you think I voted for president? They didn't even say Hillary Clinton. Obama, of course. I said, now, come on, come on. Before you call the police or kick me away from your door, release the dogs on me, mister. Answer me this. Wasn't Hillary Clinton the last person to go up against Trump. So sir, was that a test or were you just trying to be misunderstanding to our racist towards me? And he stopped. Now, most people be like, if you and you ain't got me, yeah, black power. And would have had the police or the dog, any one of those negative situations transpire but that man turned around and said you know what give me the paper that you had just he actually i didn't want to put it out there but i i gave him some literature he threw that there i'm a rep proud republican and i'm like oh you would have got slapped for that in why i'm just <laughs> laughing to myself though that's what we need in life because when you react with knowledge like i understand because I messed him up when I said, man, if only you could look up like you can everything else who I voted for in both presidential elections, except for against, I ain't going against Obama. He was right there. But when Trump came up both times, 
I, I, I had to go with him because I can't see nobody else right now because I'm not going to waste a vote. If I preach that every vote counts, there's no box there that says neither one of these candidates, which can be used. So now I say all of this because these are things that were going through my mind because there was a very big election while I was in Y, and that's one of my idols as a child. <laughs> when Arnold Schwarzenegger popped up. <laughs> Governor of I California. Said, wow, I swear. <laughs> that led me to believe that, and knowing I had read a book about Ronald Reagan, so I learned he was an actor. He was from California, went to Hollywood High. Like, oh, my God, like, he's right there. I had a girlfriend went to that school. He walked through those same corridors. And trying to communicate this with other individuals. So this is the day when I figured that out because my mom's just got busted. I owe some Southsiders some money because the distraction that I had that time, all everything else was good. All the political wanting to know, how do we vote? What's this Schwarzenegger run? I got addicted to crystal meth. So I was sniffing crystal in there. I didn't understand that even though I seen some people, like it was a lot of people. Like I wasn't one of the only, it was bad in this jail. Cause like I say, half of these staff can go to jail for murder. So what you gonna say when I say, I'm gonna tell about Ms. Baker if you don't bring this, this, that or that. So yeah, I'm on this drug and I owe some dude. My boy, rest in peace, Sapo from Frogtown. It's a sad story. I met three of his brothers in Hawaii. All three of them was killed by police. Real sad story, but I knew I could come to him and explain to him and ease things over, but I don't like being in debt. And the only reason why I'm in debt is because my weekend moms couldn't come. She got locked up. So my package didn't get here. So this wasn't a normal occurrence. So I went and talked to him. He said, no problems. That was over with. Like I did everything else right but leave the drugs alone. For me, I was writing my book at the time. I was trying to work on a lawsuit against California for that Jim TD situation. There were so many things and I used that as an excuse to use these drugs. I could stay up all night. My mind is like limitless before there was a limitless. <laughs> I, like, I need this. Finding that justification. justification. Justification, you took it right out of my mouth. Moms is in federal prison in San Diego, San Isidro Metropolitan Detention Center. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think I've talked to nobody else about this publicly. But the other big thing that happened on September 11th that I, I've never, I'm Google it later, but my mom's is a witness. There's actually a YouTuber too that could tell you because he was there. Melly Mel, the professor, that's my boy, the big homie, the hood professor, the hood postman. He was in prison on September 11th. I was in his class. The only individual, and I took this class for three years in Chino, and it's only a six-month class. The rest was all voluntarily. This was called the 187 Psychotherapy Dianalysis Group. I was the only individual in there not for murder. Everybody else was murderers. I was attempted murder. Lisa was quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. And I heard some crazy, like this class, this juvenile stuff, this lady will come with your, what they call a master file. This is a history of your whole life. And she's going to open it up case by case. Your testimony, if you snitched, if you were molested, I know everything about hundreds of people. This is why I took that class so voluntarily. WAC 100 taught me something. Keep dirt on your enemies. He keep dirt on everybody because you'll never know what to use. That was his why he said, whack 100. I'll give you that. This class was happening September the 11th. And I was looking forward to hearing what this dude who used to be a blood, like he was locked up. He, me and him did about the same. I want to say he did probably about 10 years too. No, he did longer than me. He did like 11. I wanted to hear what his case was about because everybody always speculated what he had done and he was on a sex offender unit. So we thought he molested a child or some, like we always thought this. So September the 11th was the day he was gonna talk about his case. I remember waking up that day 
And it was the woods. They were talking about fall of anarchy or something. Like they really got like uh 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 what's it called on some way anti-government type of a uh, rants on the door, kicking the door early in the morning. Boom, boom, boom. Cause I want to say that was like six here. And I'm like, what the hell? They like, we finally conquered revolution. Like, I'm like, what are they talking about? So my regular routine is to turn on the news because we're in Chino, which gives coverage of Los Angeles. So if anybody get killed in LA, we see it on the news. I wake up in the morning on the news and we see this incident with these twin towers going down. I'm like, totally thrown off. Now, if you think we was on lockdown from Ms. Baker, we like we, they locked us down for Y2K, but just for that one night, for like mm -hmm. three days, it was three days. The flu too, that swine flu, we was on lockdown until we got vaccinated. So this one right here hit differently. No, the, the kitchen workers couldn't come out, but one from each unit. And the only other people they let out was the 187 group. And this is with a psychologist. She was, her name was Deborah Leon. She was a sexy little uh, Cambodian lady with a little body on her. I looked forward to getting her class. They actually made me have to start taking it with another man because they thought we had something sexual going on. She never <laughs> gave me none though. Keep it real. We didn't talk about the boy that day. She had the news showing on a big TV, the damage. Our TVs was five inch black and white. I swear, she had that showing and went around the table and asked us all, how does it make us feel? And I promise you, nobody but myself gave a sincere opinion. Like four, it's 12 in a group. So like four of them was like, it ain't got nothing to do with me. And two of them was like, that's what they get. So she let everybody answer before she gave feedback. And like I told her, I said that I feel that it's biblical. Like this feel like the rapture, like something's happening from the, the fall of the Tower of Babel. And I was the TA. So I would help with these people having to do 21 page curriculum based work. And there was no, you would have to get a psych evaluation to make parole to get out. Like you had to pass this class to go home. And a lot of kids failed. So I would help them because I was just learning all of this stuff while studying psychology books that the staff were giving me to help inquire more knowledge and wisdom. Can you keep taking yeah. that course over and over, even if you keep failing, just keep taking it? You have to. Yeah. And our the only thing I've never seen this happen to anybody, but this is something that they utilize for the worst of the worst. It's called an 1800 refiling. And that's when they send a kid, a ward of the state back to California court to say that we have failed this dude. Or no, 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 they don't take the accountability. They say that he has failed himself and has refused to accept treatment to rehabilitate himself. And we feel he's still pursuing is a threat. So they have a hearing in adult court to see if the, if the court feels that you still present that threat, they can hold you till 35 years old. I've only seen one normal dude from Sacramento, Oak Park Bloods, Oak Park Red, that got an 1800 because he was just too violent. But that's what they would do for those kids that they felt couldn't do right. I made a living off of writing these papers. You can't graduate, this is what you do. Cats would pay me to give them the blueprint to get through this. And that was a, a, a income source. But that day on September 11th, this United States of America was like, I'll say, I'm gonna say something that I've not heard nobody else say, but they released 3,000. I can't get the exact number, but Professor Melly Mel is a very creditable source. He can validate this. My mother was there because she was one of the people that walked out of prison facing life on September 11th. I'm not 
much big, but I've heard y'all. I watched every video. Shout out to my big homie cartoon. I'm with y'all. I believe in things that most people don't. And I believe a conspiracy theory comes with just speculation. But how she get out of jail? That's not speculation. And this wasn't a state institution. She walked out the feds. We know that federal prison holds terrorists. So it's a tricky game. But that day, like I didn't know it that yet, but based on the towers coming down and my mama coming home, cause she didn't tell me, she surprised me the first visit we got. Like what the hell? How the hell this happened? And for the youngsters, instead of accepting what God gave her, cause out of that 3000 something, I could tell you this number for sure. It was three, three people went back to the parole office after that, I think it happened on a Wednesday or Thursday. By Monday, three people came back and said, hey, I don't think I was supposed to get out. Based on that, they put my mom on house arrest in a special uh, halfway house and let her fight her case from the streets where she won. And wow. Then, like I say, think about that. Who, 3,000 federal inmates, who got out that day? board. I, I believe in my conspiracy mind cartoon, Jason, Mark, that they didn't want to negotiate with terrorists openly, so they let these terrorists out secretly. And somebody in that 3,000 pool, if not many, were those cells that demanded that. Wow. Mom's really coming home is where my spirituality took off. We're in 2001 now, Crystal is a problem. And now here comes the same police. Remember 97, walking out the door, the police came. Detective Ronald K from the Los Angeles Homicide Division came to pay me a visit. Said my crime partner is finna on trial for like, he was in the county jail this whole time and went through life changes, institutional changes, growth changes. And he's been sitting in one cell in the county jail in high power, waiting to go to trial for his murder trial, death row trial. They're trying to get everybody they can to come to court and bear witness. No matter what your testimony was. Now, they were that dangling stuff over our head. Some people that have been in prison for years and got life took that as an opportunity to come down and get on the stand. I took it as an opportunity to try to come down and get more information on who told on me. All 2001. Long story short, they found him guilty, sent him to death row. Moms came home. I let go everything negative. I didn't snitch. I did everything right, but the, the crystal. So now I go up to parole board in 2003. Still making changes. Mom's beat her case. She working on a house somewhere. Got my sister back. Life is changing. And then I go to board for parole and they deny my parole. After nine years, they say, and now get this, it's three board members got to come up, two out of one got to make the decision. And they tell me it's two white, no, one white and two black. And two got to pick. So I'm like, I'm definitely going home. Didn't happen. The white guy wanted me to go home. The two black people wanted me to do more time. They said they wanted a year to see if I could do just a little bit more and graduate from a college course in there that I got out and wasn't even accredited for. So it was a worthless course. But I got out a year later and 